missions. What would DRG be like without a proper objective? Just a mindless horde shooter? Having to mine Morkut is one of the defining characteristics of the game, but that was never going to be enough. Hence why today we have a large variety of missions to choose from, and that's exactly what we're going to be looking into today. Back in the abyss? Nah, this won't cut it. Let's not be this formulaic. The term mission is very broad. It can range from mission types to deep dives to machine events and so on. With that, I'd like to establish straight off the bat that I'll be mainly focusing on mission types and the mission system itself for this episode. Also, this will be common throughout the Evolution series, but look to the top left whenever you're curious about what time period or phase I'm talking about. And when I say next build, I will always mean the next notable build. First, we got the static phase. During this period, the missions themselves were pre-made, meaning whenever you'd bring up a list of missions or a map, you'd always see the same ones no matter what time it is. The static missions will always have the same objective and biome when applicable. Even how randomized the caves themselves are depends on the mission. The first dive mission will always have the same caves with some minor tunnel variations and randomized mineral placements. Then, green depth is the polar opposite. Sometimes it'll generate the infamous supersized cave. But more often than not, I'll just make these underwhelming rooms. I've already covered a huge chunk of static missions in the pre-alpha rundown. About the only modern remnant of this phase is the tutorial mission. It even has its own specific biomes, somewhat in the spirit of the closed alpha. But after this phase comes the dynamic phase, where the missions themselves are randomly generated, and so are the caves every time a mission is launched. The original dynamic system roughly works like this. First, it decides on the biome. The mission will then pick a mission type to place in that biome. Then, it'll assemble the mission name from two large lists of wards pick a mission variation if said mission type has any, pick a compatible secondary objective, then roll the dice for any rare occurrences every time a new cave is generated, and generate a new set of missions every hour. To this day, the system hasn't changed much, but there were a few quality of life adjustments. It makes sure to generate no more than one of said mission type per biome. It also makes sure to generate at least one of each mission type in total. Mutators and anomalies can be embedded into missions, albeit within a limited quantity. One lucky mission will receive a double mutator. The dice roll for rare occurrences has a much larger list. Some take mission length into account. And a new set of missions are generated every half an hour. Oh yeah, while I'm at this, I want to get the mission icons out of the way right now. Here's a chart I made of their evolution. Yeah... I just sat here and remade a bunch of icons. The top row is for placeholder icons. The second row is specifically for these rhombus icons from early access launch. The third row contains early hexagon variations of each mission. The salvage one specifically was seen in a few public experimental builds. The fourth row contains the final variations before the big change. And the fifth row has the HD icons. Not joking. That's what they called them internally. That's also what I call the Dystrom sticker, though. Anyway, when it comes to industrial sabotage, it's not exactly known yet. I've put this up as a prediction for what the icon could be. I will admit to skipping a few things here, like these two icons here are actually differently colored. What do you mean you can't tell the difference? There was also a very short instance of Elimination's icon becoming brown. And whatever in the fuck this mess is... Like, literally, that's the same icon but color different. Jokes aside, in reality, the mission icon revolution looks something like this. I think you can see why I started with a simpler one. Now that we're done with the appetizers, it's time we dig into the buffet sitting right in front of us. That being mission types. Kicking it off with Mining Expedition. It's unsurprisingly the first mission type ever. In fact, it predates the whole mission type format, 
as before Update 7 such a thing wasn't established yet. The spiritual starting point for Mining Expedition is quite literally the very first build of DRG that has an objective. Earliest footage we have with evidence of a bare bones mining objective is this. At the end of the video, they get to a large vein of gold, and the game director proceeds to describe the rough idea of an escape sequence. Uh, when we have that feature ready, we would call for the dropship, and the dropship would uh, arrive, and we would get in there, and that would take us back to our spaceship. Since there's not much else available, we'll be jumping over to a pre alpha build which does have a fully functional objective and escape phase. First thing you'll notice is that we're not mining Morkite. In fact, there were no other resources besides gold at this time, nor were there any mules. Simply hitting any gold with your pickaxe directly adds it to the team total. You may also notice that there are two separate gold counters. This is done so that calling down a resupply doesn't subtract from the objective, but for some reason the gold collected towards the objective is doubled, or vice versa? There's a gold frenzy system, where each dwarf receives upgrades based on amount of gold collected, but this isn't specific to this mission and is prevalent throughout most of the pre-alpha. As for the escape phase, you might be wondering how do you summon a drop pod without the mule? Well, it rudely summons itself as soon as the gold quota is met. At this time it would drop as close to the dwarves as possible, which actually makes the escape itself almost non-existent. Not much really changes about the mission up until the closed alpha launch. Now that I think about it, it actually counts as update 1 to the pre-alpha. This is where the large list of pre-alpha missions were scrubbed and replaced with two, one being easier and the other being a 1000 gold objective. That's quite the bump. As for the mission changes, the gold frenzy system is removed. The devs seem to be experimenting with a wave-based system on that second mission. Got a hell of a blip heading your way, team. Get ready. The drop pod now arrives further away from the dwarves, adding the need to backtrack as part of the escape phase. Then development on update 2 starts, making drastic changes to the overall mission format. For the first time the lamp head mule is introduced. With it came the limited inventory capacity, where each dwarf was only able to carry 50 units per resource type. Now they have to deposit minerals into the robotic donkey to progress the objective and claim the resources. Said resources are transferred into a singular team inventory. Up until this point, the gold was actually counted individually. For example, Dwarf 1 could be holding 100 gold and order a resupply, while Dwarf 2 has none and could not order anything. This is also where a second mineral is introduced into the game, that being Helium Free. It is a mineral specific to the mining objective. Gold is now purely reserved for resupplies. It honestly was illogical that whenever you'd call down a resupply, the gold amount would not decrease from the objective. For Update 2's release, free static missions were added. The mule's model no longer looks like a placeholder. Helium Free was switched out in favor of Morkite, and the dwarves now carry 40 units of resources instead of 50. This is also around the time that the devs doubled down on a wave-based system. In Update 3, the mule receives some proper texturing, as for Update 4, while the mission itself didn't receive changes, this is where Nitro was introduced as the resource needed for resupply pods. This is also where the static mission Green Depth was added, although it was originally a 1000 Morkite objective. Skipping to the Early Access launch, what's likely the most significant change was made to the mining mission in Update 7. This is where it officially became a mission type called Mining Expedition, along with the switch to dynamic missions. The possible dynamic variations are 200, 225, 250, 325, and 400 Morkite missions, with an included secondary objective. Also, no longer will the draw pod get summoned instantly upon objective completion. Now there is a button on the mule for calling the escape pod. Since then, the mission type has pretty much remained the same with some very minor adjustments, like the mule's appearance slightly changing. Even the Morkite mineral's appearance has stayed practically the same since the switch from Helium Free. It's worth noting there is a voice line in modern DRG where the dwarves are thankful for not having to carry minerals all the time. I'm not entirely sure if it's a reference or a coincidence. Although there was that one thing called Search and Extract. To quickly explain it, this mission type was simply a non-linear Morkite mission. For this one, we'll have to go back to Update 2 real quick since this is where the developers experimented with non-linear versions of the mining mission, via Fractured Cavity. But for Update 7, they decided to make it its own mission type due to the noticeable difference in layout. It comes with a single 325 Morkite variation. 
here's a map shot to give you a rough idea of how search and extract differentiated from regular mining missions. You can tell it's not linear at all. For update 18, the mission type was merged with Egg Hunt and was left with a search and extract has been removed for now note. The biggest issue with the original search and extract is that players sooner or later would struggle with finding the last bit of Morkite, and the developers likely felt it resembled Mining Expedition a little too much. Although whether they will actually bring it back is very unlikely. I don't want to say never just in case this part of the video becomes inexplicably dated. With all of this in mind, it's only fitting that we move on to Egg Hunt. This one actually started off as a secondary objective. We'll be turning the clock back up to update 6. This is where it was introduced as the very first secondary objective exclusive to the Motherload mission, requiring 5 eggs to complete. Originally, the egg was buried inside the terrain with red bubbles indicating its approximate location. Its early appearance was a brown egg with pink veins? Are those veins? I don't really know what to call that. Also comes with a pulsating animation and a red glow. Update 7 is where they decided to give the secondary objective its own mission type, but they still kept its secondary counterpart for a while. At this time it was basically Mining Expedition, but if the Morkite was swapped with a Collect 10 Eggs objective, mining the eggs out of the walls wouldn't trigger any waves either, and the egg model was finally changed to green, emitting a red glow with very light pulsating animations. On Update 18, Egg Hunt received an overhaul while getting merged with Search and Extract, Instead of being a mining expedition knockoff, it tries to stand out with a non-linear setup. Now it has multiple tunnels all leading to a large cave. The size or amount of said caves depends on the mission's length and complexity. Which means that the mission now has multiple variations including 4, 6 and 8 eggs. Unique material was also added around the eggs locations and are now marked on the terrain scanner. But the waves are still timed. Whenever an egg is dug out, nothing besides freeing the egg happens. This is also when the egg's secondary objective gets removed, once and for all. For update 19, they made some adjustments to the enemy spawns. Now whenever an egg is dug out, there is a chance it will trigger a wave of enemies. If not that, then it will spawn a mini-wave. Unless you did this. Also the required egg amount has increased to 5, 7 and 10 respectively. In update 23, the egg count was lowered back down to 4, 6 and 8 again. They just couldn't make up their minds, I guess. And lastly, in update 26, the egg exploit I showed you a bit ago was fixed. While you can stop the sound from playing by instantly depositing, the enemy waves will spawn regardless. Meaning that egg hunt has remained relatively the same since then. But wait, what was that mission that the egg objective originated from? Oh yeah, point extraction. To this day, it's my personal favorite mission type. It first showed itself during Update 6's development, originally called Motherload. Like many early things, it started off untextured but already had the unfolding animation. The mine head itself was also smaller. It originally came with two floodlights and two sentries, each containing 400 bullets. And there's no button yet, meaning that as soon as the aquarks are collected, the drop pod will be summoned instantly. Also, yeah, it, it has a fucky collision. Whenever an aquark is pinged, it will still be called Blue Diz, which was its placeholder name. The wave system is also adjusted for this mission a little bit, where each wave gets progressively harder and they start almost without a warning. On Update 6's release, the Minehead model was fleshed out with a brand new unfolding animation. Now it contains 3 sentries, 2 floodlights, a big red button for summoning the draw pod, and the location of the slopes were adjusted because of the new platform for the button. For some reason there is also a high chance that you'll get a random dreadnought, probably because they wanted to get it tested. For update 7 it was turned into its own mission type due to the dynamic mission system, but it still kept its singular 10 aquark objective. Oh, by the way, wanna see how we transported aquarks before they finally gave us the ability to throw? Yep, just like that. It wasn't up until update 18 when it received the 7 aquark variation. While update 20 was being worked on, the sentry model received an upgrade, so in turn the minehead sentries were affected. A big piece of the sentry was painted red with a few yellow parts here and there. There's also an untextured screen that's supposed to be a detailed ammo counter. And for update 20's launch they made the new screen work properly for the minehead. 
On update 21, the sentries were made pure yellow again, and the hologram indicating where the minehead will land was added. Up until this point, you wouldn't know its exact landing location until it comes crashing down through the ceiling. For the second hotfix, the sentries received an increase in ammunition, going from 400 to 600 bullets, although there was a visual bug that would still say it has 400, even though that's not true. On update 25's release, the minehead received a visual upgrade. The sentries now come with a familiar and unique model which is completely different from the ones Engineer carries. The floodlight is no longer just two cylindrical octagons slapped onto a slab. And the minehead itself received some color and texture adjustments. And finally, on update 32, the minehead itself received some love. So yeah, Point Extraction's history consists of model adjustments and many other minor changes so far. So minor that some of which I haven't even mentioned. But what gives with that random Dreadnought? Elimination. Although originally, it wasn't about killing Dreadnoughts. Its spiritual starting point is all the way back at the pre-alpha. Back then, the closest counterpart to Elimination were a couple of linear missions that require for the players to destroy Brood Nexuses. The players would actually have to utilize their radar at the top to locate the targets. At this time, destroying a Brood Nexus would spawn a Praetorian regardless if it's part of the objective. Then for Closed Alpha's launch, the Eliminate Targets missions were removed. They didn't really do anything with this concept up until Update 6's development. In this iteration, you have to destroy Brood Nexuses, but now they're green. The Nexus now attempts to hurt nearby dwarves via emerging spikes, and the Dreadnought spawns once it's destroyed. Now, the Dreadnought is technically a creature, but it's undoubtedly a huge part of this mission type. So I'll go through its evolution now and then I'll unavoidably will have to tackle this awkward situation if and whenever I do a creature evolution episode. The Dreadnought itself was actually added to update 5. Originally, it simply featured a double health bar. The first health bar being its shell, which doesn't regenerate over time, but is much larger. The second one being its naked ass, which can receive weak point damage. Its moveset consists of melee attacks, mega fireball spit, trembling stomp, summoning grunts, and incredible eye contact. There are also some interesting mission control voice lines that can be heard, suggesting that at one point elimination would have been about exterminating bugs. Okay, this is Warning. a hunt. We've got an infested cave. Get in there, clean the buggers out, extreme prejudice. But this mission type didn't release up until Update 7, with a singular Free Dreadnought Cocoons variation. This is also where it got a proper Cocoon model instead of the placeholder Brood Nexus one. The emerging spikes were removed and the Dreadnought itself received minor color adjustments. At this time, the Cocoon locations were marked on the HUD instead of the terrain scanner. It's worth noting that in an early Update 7 build, there's a somewhat linear version of this mission. It didn't last long though. For update 18, a shorter variation of the mission was added, spawning two Dreadnought eggs. During update 23's development, the Dreadnought received an overhaul. Now the shell regenerates periodically, random waves are disabled during the fight, it has the ability to dig terrain, and it now shoots literal eggs at you, which spawn a bunch of pink swarmers. In turn, the move used for summoning grunts was removed, but that roar animation was kept. Lastly, Dreadnought Cocoon HUD markers were removed in favor of showing them on the terrain scanner instead. By the time Update 23 released, the Dreadnought's egg attack received a unique projectile. There's now one hit organic material all around the cocoon. The cocoon itself had some visual adjustments made to it, and there's now a large boss health bar that appears on the HUD. For the next update, the Dreadnought's model received an upgrade. No longer does it look like a reskin of a Praetorian. On update 25, the Dreadnought's shell now regenerates at specific health points. Up until now, you could really just pop its shell and finish it off before it had a chance to regenerate it. Then, the Elimination mission type didn't receive any notable changes up until update 33's early builds. This is where the developers were working on an overhaul, adding two brand new Dreadnought bosses and boosting the table- uh, I mean original Dreadnought. Ignore that. One of the earliest implementations of the twins were curiously using the early Dreadnought model, but recolored. Their placeholder names were Glyphid Melee Twin and Glyphid Youngling. At this time, they had very few special moves each. 
It seems like they only start using more moves, as the opposite twin has less health. Melee twin could perform a very slow ground pound. A short fire breath and would chase after dwarves, while the youngling would fire a large spread of fireballs, occasionally launch a timed explosive, and step away from the dwarves. They both would attempt a health trade move, but it doesn't actually work and it didn't make them invulnerable at the time. Also, whenever they receive a large amount of damage, they would bury to temporarily protect themselves. The placeholder name for the Hive Guard was simply Glyphid Heavy Guard. It used a blue colored model of the Dreadnought and yellow spheres to simulate the free weak points. As for special moves, it appears to have most of them just unfinished. It'll summon a swarm of special recolored Praetorians just before exposing its weak points. While the swarm is in the area, it'll occasionally shoot a fireball at the players. Once the sentinels are cleared, it'll spam free fireballs and once its ass is exposed, it'll launch rocks in various directions. By the way, the free weak points almost don't matter at all, as you can deplete its main health bar via elemental attacks. For the next build, the melee twin now buries itself and attempts to charge at the player from beneath. Its fire breath attack also seemingly lasts longer. The youngling shoots the fireball spread more rapidly, now it's out free timed explosives and actually tries to stick to the walls and ceilings, but the health trade still doesn't work. The Heavy Guard or Hive Guard received a proper model. It now launches a lot more rocks around itself while Taz is exposed. But it appears to be bugged as it can only deplete its health with elemental attacks now. In the next build, the twins now have proper models. The way the twins perform moves has changed a bit. Now by default it'll use the Fire Breath attack. And as soon as one of them reaches low health, then it'll start the Burrow attack. The youngling now shoots those timed explosives by default, and the fireball spread once one of them reach low health. And again, the health trade is still broken. The heavy guard's spherical weak points were replaced by the crystal looking ones we have today. The health invulnerability now properly activates and cannot be bypassed by elemental damage. And by the time update 33 releases, the new bosses receive proper names. Of course, most of these changes took place before release, but I've decided to skip to this build as there will be more stuff to document within one go. The Lacerator was given the ability to perform a rock wave attack. We'll also make an obvious diving animation, whenever it'll try to charge at dwarves from below. It now reacts to whenever the other twin dies by performing a stronger version of the underground charge, and just generally being more aggressive. The Arbalist, on the other hand, pretty much maintains the same set of moves but upon the other twin's death will let out a barrage of timed explosives in all directions. Oh yeah, and the health trade finally works properly. As for the Hive Guard, the Sentinels now come with a unique model, and those untextured rock projectiles now have a proper appearance. Meanwhile, the original Dreadnought was made somewhat harder to match up a bit better with the new boss lineup. The most notable adjustments were a massive radius increase to its stomping ability, invulnerability for a few seconds while the shell is regenerating, and an increase to its movement speed. I've also learned that the aimless roaring it performs was purposefully left in to give solo players a better chance to strike. Finally, for Season 1 or up to 35, Hiveguard's Rock Burst ability was upgraded to be more effective against players. I should note that I've skipped through some balancing adjustments that were too minor or simply felt a little too boring. Um, I don't know how to transition into this one, but it's time for... Salage Operation. This was the first mission type to be added post early access launch. Some of you already know this, but originally the mission had nothing to do with mini meals. You'd have to collect various parts to fix up the abandoned drop pod. Here I'm able to spawn in these power supplies which would have been used for the drop pod. From its file name, we can indeed tell this was meant to be one of said parts you'd need to collect. Sadly, they purely act as resources and cannot be used for anything except depositing in this build. Especially since by this point, the mini mules were already in the game. The mini mule legs were still colored brown, and a ton more of them would spawn around the mules, even though only two are needed to fix one up. In total, there's three mini mules to find. Whenever a mini mule leg is loosened up, a wave of enemies spawn instantaneously. Keep in mind this is still a thing in modern DRG, except it's not as obvious and seems to only happen once per a set of legs. 
Also, the mini mule is instantly repaired as soon as the second leg is attached, skipping the need for holding E. The mini mules will often start following Molly when it's ready. By that I mean that sometimes it just bug out because this is early stuff. But not all mule repairs go as smoothly as that. The most common issue in early salvage is that the mule legs are sometimes placed way too far away. I should note that in this early state, the mission had very similar cave generation to that of Elimination. Afterwards comes the uplink. In this state it would spawn right next to the draw pod. Maybe it was planned to be on the draw pod rather than beside it? Upon activation, it'll provide with a much larger blue defense area, but the defense phase also lasts much longer. Since there are no fuel cells yet, you're able to make the escape after the uplink. This build reflects current day salvage a lot more. For starters, the cave type was switched from that of eliminations to point extractions. Blue's mule legs were made green and less of them spawn. Number of mini mules needed for repairs was reduced to two, but you now have to hold E for a while to repair the mule. The uplink and fuel cells are instantly placed near the drop pod. Their appearances consist of a large computer. The uplink has a gray one with a dish, and the fuel cells simply have a red one. Also, the abandoned drop pod received four red lights around it. The defense zone was greatly reduced, although the defense time remains unaltered. Technically doubled since now you have to activate the fuel cells as well. Afterwards, the dwarves now have to wait for two minutes for the drop pod to start up and then they get an infinite amount of time to make the escape. Although it's worth noting that the defense phase might last as long as it does because I'm testing this in solo. I'm just speculating but maybe it didn't compensate for the lack of players at this time? In this build, the cave type changes once more, now having its own unique generation which consists of a spawn room that leads into a usually extra large area. Not always though. Mini meal count was brought back to free, and they provide with gold and nitro upon repair. They also need free legs reattached. Number of mule legs spawned were reduced to barely enough. Various rusty parts were placed around the abandoned drop pod and an area is now carved around the pod. The fuel cell now is called down after the uplink is ready, and a beacon is placed indicating where it'll land. The model was swapped out for a strange rusty one that sorta looks like a minimalistic rocket, and the countdown was brought back for the escape. In Update 14's first experimental build, the cave type received some minor adjustments, mainly to the spawn room. Mini mule leg count was somewhat increased. Repairing a mini mule now also adds the biome's crafting resources to the team inventory. The abandoned drop pod received a new texture to make it appear like it was actually abandoned. The uplink model received some adjustments. Now has this screen detail attached to it. The blue lamps and the dish only activate when the uplink has been set up. It lights up green once finished. The fuel cell model, I believe is the same, but had its texture changed, and four of the same model were stretched out and added to each side. The brown parts of the cells light up green when the defense phase is done. Now moving on to update 14's public release. Repairing mini meals no longer rewards with the biome's crafting resources. The uplink's dish model was upgraded. And, oh, that's it. For update 15, the uplink received a brand new model which now plays an animation as it gets repeatedly hit with a hammer. Fuel cell beacon was made green and was given new text. Fuel cell's appearance also changed dramatically with its own setup animation. And drop pod startup time was reduced from 2 minutes to 1.5. For update 18, a shorter variation of the mission was added, only spawning 2 mini mules. In update 23, the defense zone radius was finally increased. In update 26, the various objects found in the mission now have the most basic physics applied, so they fall down when there's no surface under them. Up until this point, you could get a mini mule suspended in mid-air, while you were playing as a solo scout. For update 28, they added buried abandoned resupplies that could spawn. I am under the belief that initially this was a scrapped idea for salvage operation. The abandoned pod also changed, since around this time the drop pod model itself was prepping for an upgrade. The paint on the pod had almost completely fallen off in this iteration. In the next update, the drop pod model received an overhaul. And in turn, the texture for the abandoned one was changed to have much more paint on the pod. And finally, for update 33, the mission received some very notable adjustments. Upon locating a mini mule, players can interact with it to temporarily mark the location of all mule legs on the terrain scanner. In turn, making the physical legs emit sounds. And to make the fuel cell process make much more sense, players now have to actually connect it to the drop pod. Thanks to... 
on-site refinery, which is the next mission on the list. Due to the third year anniversary stream, we'll be able to take a look at this and Escort's conceptual phases. The concept name for this mission type is Heavy Extraction, although in game it stole Monorail as an internal name. Its original vision in the conceptual phase is as follows. Arrive into the caves with a minehead refinery dropping in shortly after. Connect conveyor belts from the refinery to the mother veins. Establish one or more extractor at the mother veins. When all the extractors are set up, they will start pumping the vein of its contents into the refinery. The team then returns to the refinery. When it's full, the refinery will leave and then an escape pod is called down. From the features area, we can see Refinery with Minehead, Building Conveyor Belt. Interestingly, the ability to grind was planned from the start and of course has a no molly note, but instead you would have been able to deposit anywhere on the conveyor. What's up with this conveyor belt situation? Well, instead of setting up pipes, in the conceptual phase you would have set up conveyor belts. Obviously, they ended up favoring the pipelines a lot more. And in this same concept art, we can see the idea carrying over when it comes to depositing into the pipeline. Now, in the earliest refinery build that I have access to, they do indeed utilize a modified version of the minehead as the refinery. The five slots which normally hold floodlights and sentries are empty, with the addition of four pipe starting points placed on each slope. At this point, they had already switched to pipes from conveyor belts, but they are in an extremely early state as evidenced by the lack of any feedback when building these pipes and the lack of textures. The only limitation to building pipes is that they cannot be mid-air, but otherwise the segments can be stretched as far as needed. Yeah, I was able to make some monstrosities with this. We can also see these grinding posts on each pipeline segment, which could mean that they still plan for each segment to be a deposit point, but at this time you had a mule with you for depositing purposes. When it comes to connecting the pipes, I don't think that you can. I believe this is such an early iteration of this mission that you cannot actually complete it yet. I'm likely meant to do something with these random bedrocks jutting out of the ground. If not, then these mysterious black surfaces that did not appear ever again for me except for this one screenshot here. I'm unable to either summon any sort of extractor nor am I able to connect the pipe directly to these. Even the objective isn't really there. In the next build that I have, the refinery now comes with a unique, very slapped together model. I mean, this thing has no deposit areas and you can't really walk around the platform. The model itself is made out of a bunch of cylinders, a stripped down draw pod, a bunch of these models that are from the space rig, and still maintains the four pipeline starting points. The pipes themselves were made smaller and given a texture. There now is a basic length limit applied when building them. Although, you can still do stuff like this. There are now three of these strange chunks emitting a constant spark with a blue sphere around them. It doesn't seem like I'm able to do anything with them, even though they are marked as refinery targets. Here's a strange note. You're able to start the pipeline at the front and at the back of it. I cannot imagine what purpose that serves. Lastly, there is this funny bug that lets you start building another segment from the pipeline's hologram. Yeah, this, this build was kind of fun to mess around with. In this build, the refinery model goes through another major change. It's now this completely untextured model with various simplistic shapes. One deposit point has been added to it as well as a button. Three giant canisters are placed around the refinery with pipeline starting points. And an upside down drop pod is placed on top of it. In terms of the pipe building, each pipe segment now has a stand of sorts holding up the pipeline. Two rails were added at the top of the pipes and very rudimentary grinding is now available. It now runs a check for any surfaces blocking the hologram, and it's really stingy about it. The pipes can now be deconstructed with free pickaxe hits. I can finally order an extractor at those refinery target models, which summons a minimalistic pump jack. Of course, the pipeline can be connected to the pump jack, which finally makes the mission completable. Once a pipeline is fully connected, it then needs to be activated at each corresponding segment. After all the pipelines are connected, the pumping sequence starts automatically, and each of those giant canisters fill up individually. When a pipeline is working properly, the canister lights up yellow. When a segment is damaged, it lights up red. Damaged segments emit a large red beacon and are marked on the HUD. In this iteration, it's always the segment connecting to the pump jack that break on their own. Whichever pipeline breaks down is purely random, as one pipeline could break down more than five times, 
Meanwhile, the other one broke only twice. Once all three canisters are full, the escape pod is automatically summoned. Due to its unfinished nature, the pipeline segments still break down regardless if the canister is full or not. Then, a while later, the refinery receives a, uh... Is minimalistic even the right word for this HUD? The refinery model hasn't received any changes yet, but the pipe segment grinders were removed from the model, and were also given a different type of stand for each segment. Refinery target points now have a strong light source attached to them. The pump track model, instead of having no texture, now has a basic one applied to it. And around this time is when they put in a very basic PDA tool used for pipe building. The refinery pumps have to be started up manually. Also, the pipelines break down a lot less frequent. Either that or my RNG was really good every time. Each canister still have to be filled up individually. And once they are full, the escape pod also has to be summoned manually via the button. In this next build, the refinery appears to be in the middle of an art pass. The most notable bit for me is this platform up here, and the fact that the three giant canisters are no longer present. The pipes now don't appear fully built upon placement, rather you just kind of place down their skeleton, and is covered by the pipe layer only when being constructed. Inexplicably, pipe grinding is either disabled or broken in this build. Bosco is able to help out with pipe building from here on out. An early functional HUD is now in place with colored squares representing the state of each pipeline. Yellow meaning no pipeline, cyan pipeline started, green pipeline finished, red pipeline is leaking. During the refinery sequence, whenever any pipeline breaks down, the entire refinery stalls. No longer are there separate canisters that need to be filled up. Also, the entire refining process is a lot longer here. I should mention the cave formations are becoming much more unique around this time rather than the strange mishmash of point extraction in various other caves. From this build forward, everything will be exceptionally familiar. For starters, the refinery model is now nearly identical to the current one with some minor differences. This version of the refinery contains two red lamps, stretched out placeholder textures, this unfinished exhaust of some sort, and still has the early pipe starting points. Pipeline building is nearly identical, save for the building tool having non-functioning screens. Building pipes will now carve an area around itself when necessary. You now get a neat platform for grinding. There's also acceleration functionality, and grinding must be initiated by pressing E while standing on a pipe. The refinery target was changed to be a part of the terrain called depleted Morkite crust. Now emits a stream of fire with a strong pink light source. The pump jack was given a brand new model, although connecting pipes to them simply doesn't work sometimes. Starting up the refinery pumping will make the refinery and pump jacks play an early animation. The refining process was made a lot shorter when compared to the previous build. Enemies now target broken pipe segments. Also, I think it's worth showing the extremely early state of this mission's miner's manual page. In this build, the refinery model is pretty much finished. With the addition of two lamps, texture adjustments, and that exhaust thingy is now properly modeled. Pipeline starting points are the most notable thing here, as the starting rails themselves are glowing the same colors as the small light did from the previous iterations. The pump jack now plays a landing animation. Its base will also rotate according to where the pipeline was connected, and setting up the pipe segments now plays a very delayed animation of the screws sealing by themselves. Hey, after that comes the first build that closed testers received. I'm pointing that out so you can get a rough idea of what state the updates usually are in when closed testing starts. First of all, almost exclusive to this build, after the initial briefing, Mission Control will pop in a bit later to explain exactly what the dwarves need to do. It goes like this. Orkite will. Pump jack. Pipeline. Get to it. The refinery model had those red lamps taken out and some yellow ones put in, with a few other minor changes. Pipe building now provides with a minimalistic message telling the user why the pipe cannot be placed. Also, the first segment of the pipeline is always automatically fully constructed. Those colored lights at the starting point of a pipeline were changed and placed on each segment instead. As for the refining process, seems like the animations have made some progress, but that's about it. And even then, I'm not really sure if the animation changed. Skipping over to the first public experimental build to rack up some of those precious changes. There is now an unfolding animation played when the refinery first arrives. 
an actual HUD is implemented instead of the free colorful squares, each pipeline is now numbered, an icon appears alongside a pipe building error, there is now a green wrench hologram at pipe segments which need to be constructed. Markite wells now have a distinct model again. The screen above the refinery's button now displays text when the refinery is ready to start, but after that it won't display anything. And they want to hammer home on this? The pipe grinding was made a lot better, by allowing players to sort of bunny hop on them and gain traction. Whichever developer made this happen, you definitely rock. And stone. With that, we're hopping over to a release build, this one coming with some hot fixes. First and foremost, the pipe building PDA finally displays all sorts of stats relevant to pipe placement. The numbers on pipeline segments were made yellow and the wrench hologram was changed to blue. Morkite wells were made bluish, with it emitting a lot of smoke with bursts of blue fire. And those depleted Morkite crests were removed. The pump jack's landing animation was somewhat improved. And the little screen at the button now displays more information. That's pretty much on-site refinery's evolution for the time being. Since this mission has a lot more stuff to it than others, there was simply a lot more to cover, leaving us with one more mission. And that's Escort Duty. We are also able to take a look at this mission's conceptual phase thanks to that same art showcase segment. The conceptual name for this mission was Drilling Bomb Gase... G gas Extractor Vehicle Payload Overwatch. Ugh, dude, shut up. The goal of the mission seems to be unclear at this date. The drill dozer might have been a bomb at one point. Another idea suggests that it would have sat on top of gas vents. But the refuel idea has been present even in this conceptual stage. Along with defending the vehicle against enemies. Same for parts of the drill dozer breaking apart. There are also some cave structure notes one officially labeling the escort caves as being linear without any tunnels. There's also a note here for super hard materials blocking drillers from checking ahead. Interestingly, originally this wasn't going to feature a mule. In some cases, having a mule on this mission does feel a bit off, but I understand as to why Molly had to stay. Other notes state a new mineral for refueling the vehicle, something to blow up as the end goal, gas vents or something for the vehicle to sit on, and directional defense while the vehicle drills. One curious note from the concept art is this gun on legs thing. Perhaps there was a minuscule chance for drivable vehicles for this mission? Uh, best not to look too much into that. Alright, now let's head on over to the mission's in-game state. Once more, taking a look at the earliest iteration that I have of it. So, this beautiful block of machinery is one of the earliest models of Doretta. Although, I believe there are even earlier iterations, ones that were spotted in the third year's art showcase map. Oh yeah, it can also spawn like this. Upon starting the drill, it makes a very loud banging sound. And it starts drilling. Not to be confused with drifting. At this time, instead of an objective, it would display the drill's health. Damaging it is very easy, but repairing it is extremely slow. Repairing also just freezes the dwarf in place. Once the drill's health reaches zero, the mission ends without warning. The drill seeks out these areas with very bright blue crystals, and some sort of tube coming out of it. I can only assume these are some sort of remnants from the gas vent idea. Once the drill arrives at one of these spots, it'll come to a dead stop, and the large tube will pop out the back. That tube then needs to be filled up with oil shale. It also appears this mineral was called oil shale from very early on although you'd simply have to mine it with your pickaxe at this time. Once roughly 50 units of oil shell are deposited into the tube, the drill can be started up again. Oh, what the fuck? <laughs> what? The dude just went light speed. <laughs> okay, cool, great. I even turned up the frame rate to get a better look at what's happening here. You won't really see a difference on YouTube, but it's just constantly rotating at insane speeds. And that process of the drill stopping and needing to be refilled can loop once or twice more. Afterwards, you're done with the mission and can summon the escape pod. But you're able to activate the drill once more even after you're able to summon the drop pod. Of course I pressed it, and here's a sort of time lapse of what it did. The drill just followed its trail back to spawn. I hope this also signifies how awful its tunnels are in the early builds. 
That thing has some astounding technology. Moving on to another build. While the drill is still just a giant block, its appearance has changed a bit. It now has a rectangular head. A basic suspension system of sorts for its tank treads or as they're actually called, continuous tracks. Its health seems to have increased to 3000, and the rectangular head lights up red whenever the drill dozer is damaged. Starting up the drill? <laughs> Whoa, look at it go! Oh man. Starting it up now plays a loud chainsaw-like sound, with the drill punch now residing in the background. When drilling terrain, a ton of rocks will come flying across the vehicle, blinding me. The refueling process seems practically unchanged, unless you count the refueling tube being incredibly stretched out as a Warvy addition. But instead of a third refuel, the drill reaches a giant yellow low poly orb, and sort of just plants on top of it. A two minute countdown starts on the HUD with the phrase defend the drill. Once the countdown reaches zero, the orb then explodes, releasing a green error cube. At this time it had no special name attached to it, and really just had the error cube's name on the ping tool. But once deposited, the actual name appears to be Lumix Core. And then the escape phase begins. Now, on to the next build that I own. The drill model received a set of new lamps. It also comes with a brand new HUD element, temporarily calling the drill JEB, or JEB. No idea what's the joke here, but I was told it's just a placeholder. The main purpose of this HUD is to display the drill's health bars and the current speed. The speed of course isn't affected at this time. Hmm. Appears that Mr. Jeb here is in god mode. Even 20 slashers cannot damage it. When starting up the drill, you'll notice that, uh... The drilling is even more blinding. At least it's quiet now. At this stage, the assumedly gas vent remnants are completely gone. Now it's purely about refueling the drill. In fact, four rocket icons appear on the HUD when it needs to be refueled. The drill now needs a lot more oil shell to complete the refueling process. Approximately 190 units, and as you deposit, each rocket icon fills up. I should note that you don't have to deposit the oil into the drill for it to count towards the refueling. You can just deposit it into the mule, which is what I did for the most part. Once the drill is refueled twice, it'll arrive at the yellow orb once more this time waiting for the player to start up the drill themselves. Everything else is pretty much unchanged right down to the green cube. In this build, a giant cube now drops down from above. You can press the button to make it disappear and reveal the drill inside. The model appears to be unchanged, aside from these two, but we'll get to them soon. Upon starting the drill, there appears to be a very basic functionality for Jeb's speed. At least I'm getting these debug messages at the top left here about its speed changing. The drill can be damaged by enemies once more, but not by dwarves. Whenever it's damaged, it'll now play that classic car siren sound. Repairing has greatly improved, not just with the new animation from Refinery, but you won't just freeze in place when doing so. The healing is also faster when the drill isn't under attack. As for the refueling process, that's where the two new models on the drill come in. They are actually early iterations of fuel canisters. Some of you may remember a similar model used for a weapon prototype a while ago. When approaching oil shell with it, it'll open up and suck it up when the right mouse button is pressed. Also, this is where oil shell became a 4-hit mineral. Once the canister is full, you simply bring it back to the drill and do the same with the other one. I'm sure everyone knows this part already. After which the player can start the drill back up again, and then... Well... No, actually. On the second refill, the canisters remain full and I'm unable to pick them back up. Effectively leaving me softlocked right here. Of course, I remained calm. And realized I could just take the camera to the yellow orb to get a look at its visual progress. The thing has gotten fancier with these yellow rings all around it. Looks kinda nice, actually. In this next build, the giant cube takes a few moments to land instead of arriving instantaneously. The drill model now has an animated hatch attached to its back and two extra rectangles. It seems that Jeb's health was also greatly reduced. It did honestly survive a ton of damage in the previous builds. When the drill is attacked, it lets out a horn sound as a warning, and the damaged part turns red until repaired. 
Each health segment now actually corresponds to each rectangle. Jeb now suffers permanent damage when a segment is empty. And when the drill is destroyed, Mission Control says... This is it, boys! In a dwarf's voice. During the refuel phase, the hatch on the drill's back opens up revealing four slots. Two of which have the refueling canisters. The four slots may mean that at some point they wanted to hand out one canister per dwarf. The canisters received a brand new model that is held at the center of the screen. It now automatically mines oil shell when the user is close and looking straight at it. Holding right mouse button just produces an animation bug. The rocket icons on the HUD were reduced to two and show what dwarf is carrying the canister. You also need a lot more oil shell to fill it up. Once the drill is running again, it goes straight to the end goal, without a need of a second refuel. Oh, damn. The low poly orb now has a proper model, and the Omeron itself has received a bunch of colored rings around it. This looks really good. Perhaps a bit too colorful for DRG, but that won't stop me from making some backgrounds out of this scene. I should note, those rings cannot be penetrated by the driller's drills but they can still be destroyed with pickaxes. Everything else gameplay-wise is seemingly unchanged. You still have to guard the drill for two minutes as it attempts to penetrate the Amaron. The Amaron will deteriorate as the drill makes progress. And when the defense phase is over, instead of a green error cube, we get an orange sphere, which is signed by a developer for some reason. Wait, Kugel? Oh no, never mind. it's cool. Just a Danish word for spheres. Now, going over to this build, the drill model received some proper treads and can be damaged by friendly fire once more. In terms of the HUD, the health segments were moved around, the blue ones corresponding to the side parts, and the yellow on top is the drill's core health. At the same time, a lot of the base health was moved to the core. There's also a new green bar for the fuel. As y'all already know, the fuel bar really just tells you how long it'll be until the drill arrives to the next cave. With that said, this also really puts into perspective of how long the travel time is in these early builds. In terms of refueling, the canister's mining needs to be manually activated via the left mouse button now, but it still opens up when looking at oil shield within range. When it comes to the Omoran, its appearance was revamped along with some new coat of paint. The rings around it were greatly reduced and recolored to ruby red with a violet gloss. There were also four of these crystal things placed around it. Starting up the drill now provides with a boss health bar. It's not as functional as it looks, but each defense phases are roughly here. Whenever the drill is damaged, it stops attempting to crack through the shell for a short period. Glad that isn't part of the mission anymore. During the second health segment, an early iteration of flying rocks will appear. In this instance, I got a ton of them all attacking at once. But afterwards, no more seemed to spawn. For the third health segment, these defensive crystals start spawning in which will zap the drill. The fourth health segment will produce a few more flying rocks, then just keep spawning enemies like normal. And everything after the shell is cracked remains unchanged from the previous build. But in this build, upon initial arrival the drill's giant box now has a longer delay before dropping in. The drill itself didn't change much, but the HUD was completely redesigned. Much more in tune with the release one save for the refueling part. The fuel canisters now have a much longer range for collecting oil shell. At the same time, it was made a lot slower. Unless you use it to collect chunks. Here's something interesting though. This has been present for some of the previous builds already. They were experimenting with various mission lengths for escort, one of which includes an extra short version with zero refuels. It just gets to the Omeron and starts drilling it. While it's a lot shorter, I'm just too used to the refuels at this point where this felt quite lacking. Alright, now let's get to this iteration of the Omeron shell. Appearance-wise, the rings around it were completely removed, with a few other adjustments made. More notable changes came to the Omeron fight itself. Now whenever the drill dozer is damaged, it'll simply keep drilling instead of pausing for a brief period. In phase 2, the Omeron grabs some flying rocks, which themselves have changed appearance. For phase 3, the dwarves simply have to fight off glyphid hordes. And phase 4, defensive crystals emerge from the ground, with a very different formation. In terms of everything after the fight, nothing has changed. Well, the sphere does get snapped to the meal once deposited. Now, just like I did with refinery, 
I'd also like to skip to the first closed tester build to rack up some changes. The giant cube now sort of looks like a garage. Not that it looks like a random smattering of metal tubes. It does come with a very basic opening animation. The real highlight is the Drill Dozer's actual model, which is now in place. Although not polished yet. Drill Dozer appears to consist of the same yellow texture all throughout its body, except for the currently exposed part turning red once damaged. The refueling process is a lot more akin to release. The canister now emitting a laser when activated, the refueling HUD also making improvements. But I believe the oil shell collection is still slower. What's interesting is that collecting oil shell chunks is a lot faster, as it functions like a vacuum cleaner at this point. In terms of the Omoran fight, the flying rocks are now pretty fast. Defensive crystals have changed appearance, and seems like they only spawn at the start of the phase. Return Omeron Hearthstone. Okay. Warping over to that release build with some hotfixes in place. First off, the big box now actually looks like a giant cargo holder. They spared more colors for the drill dozer, ironed out the kinks, and fully animated the Retta's head, which of course can be petted. For the refueling process, the canister models were finished up and painted red. You can move faster while carrying it than before. It now opens when the mining laser is activated. Also can gather oil shell faster, but it doesn't suck up chunks like a vacuum cleaner anymore. Oh yeah, there's also aggressive scaling applied to how much fuel is needed depending on the player count. As for the Amoran, its visuals have been further enhanced with various particles, and its dark red surface was made larger. When it comes to the fight, it's been fully polished. Between each phase, the Hearthstone will release a powerful shockwave. The flying rock model was changed, they were also made a bit slower, and I believe that less of them spawn. Defensive crystal appearance has changed so that it wouldn't take more than 2 to 3 hits to destroy one. They also keep emerging throughout the 4th phase, instead of just doing it once. The Hearthstone itself received a proper model as well as being actually strapped to the mule. In update 33, they made it so Doretta's head pops out and can be brought back to the escape pod. In Season 1, I swear they brought the rooms closer so the Drill Dozer will reach its destinations faster. Lastly, in Season 2, when the Retta's head is rescued, it will now appear in the space rig next to the equipment terminal. Yeah, escort duty had quite the journey. Undoubtedly was the most interesting to showcase in terms of visual designs. Also, those wallpapers of the colorful Omoran variations are real. You can find the album to them and some other stuff in the description. And that's it when it comes to the mission types. Actually, wait. I can't help but feel I'm forgetting something. Something that people will probably scream at me in the comments if I don't mention it. Oh yeah, the tutorial mission. Of course. As it doesn't have much of an evolution, we'll be covering four iterations of it. Consider this as a bonus chapter. In an early build of Update 7, the very first tutorial mission was available. This iteration was really just a 200 Morkite mission where each room attempts to be the same. Kind of like a remixed version of the first dive mission from the closed alpha. Some of the rooms shuffle between a very small selection of cave formations. It didn't come with a unique biome yet, just plain fungus box. You also weren't limited to one class yet. And it crashes every time you try to summon the escape pod. The tutorial mission was of course finished up by Early Access launch, and radically different. It's now a Gunner exclusive 100 Morkite mission with special mission control voice lines, and comes with a unique biome. The three rooms are now actually the same each time. First one being this room with two pillar formations, second one being the zipline room which is designed to teach the player on how to use the zipline, third one being a large room with a tube shaped bridge which leads you to a small room. This is generally where you're expected to complete the objective. Then, for a very short period, there was an intriguing bug that occurred where the tunnels between each room got gigantic. It gives us an interesting look at the biome, but biome stuff is for another video. In preparation for the 1.0 launch, they wanted to revise the tutorial mission as it's gotten really old by this point. For update 29, Bosco was disabled for this mission. It also received these tutorial boxes. Starting off with Throw Free Flares, Mine 20 Gold, Dig Dirt, Get Morkite, 
etc. The caves themselves have remained relatively the same, but they come with a new addition being this narrow hallway, which has a wave trigger in it. Mission Control assumes that the dwarf will perish, but little does he know, you cannot die. You have literal plot armor. The rest of the Morkite was all moved to the very end of the cave. That tube bridge area only hiding a Praetorian now. There are also a ton more unique voice lines put into this mission. That mission control guy better bloody lay off me once I end my place. Presumably to leave a strong impression for new players. You can experience them right now by launching the mission for yourself. I should note that Greenbeard still receives tutorial boxes after the mission. That's also where Mission Control's introduction to Bosco was moved. That's pretty much tutorial mission. And I want to touch upon one more thing for this video. Since the game seems to consider machine events as a third objective once completed, I thought it would make too much sense to quickly check it out. I should note that when it comes to machine events, I can't get much of a look at its full evolution. So I'll showcase each of their early variations within a single build. First off, Ebonite event. The early model is radically different, and has a very similar style to the mule and drop pod. Perhaps at one point most of DRG's machinery was going to be colored brown and yellow. Once all four batteries are pushed in, the machine event then starts, and the mission control says an early variation of the Tritolite voice line. Toss him at it, that should do it. Do not get that stuff on you though, it'll eat through anything. Shortly after, the rock glyphids show up. Besides the pickaxe boosters lacking a proper model, and the rock Praetorian still counting as just one kill, it's pretty much the same. Well, aside for the missing particles. The corn fuser even lets out the large shockwave in an attempt to clear any remaining enemies at the end. After the event, we get to see the early Matrix core model as I insert it. No interface shows up, which may mean that it was completely random at this time. Then, we got the curse side event. This model appears much more like a placeholder especially with the lack of textures for the deposit point. Once the event is activated, the dwarf is tasked with gathering 10 of these cursite samples. It seems that at this time only acid spirits could spawn with the infection. The cursite samples still decay even in this early state. Next we have the Trudolite event, which is just a giant rectangle or a monolith. What would normally be four lasers around it are these strange blue cubes instead. The bomb dispenser appears to be identical to the current one, but it seems to drop a lot closer to the Tritolite crystal. Or I just kept getting lucky. And finally, the Omen Tower event. I have already talked about it in Classified 8, but I'll do it again here. Feel free to skip to the ending. The early version of this tower has all four modules at once, and is pretty much a stack of small colorful hexagons. Most notably, you don't need to push in any batteries to activate the event, and the maintenance platforms are missing. Instead, the weak points are exposed at all times. Each module also has humorous placeholder names. Santa Claus corresponding to the drone replicator, Angry Stick Part corresponding to the heavy burster, Blind Man with Laser Pointer corresponding to the Radial Pulse Gun and Twin Slicer. Originally, I described this early iteration of the event as being a lot shorter, but a lot harder. With that said, I discovered that you can take it down exceptionally fast with a breach cutter. And it can spawn inside of a mine head. Well, that's pretty much everything, except for various details they felt weren't worth mentioning, industrial sabotage evolution, and any other mission stuff they may do in the future. I didn't include sabotage yet for two reasons. I felt this mission was already getting really long. By the way, if you watched with zero skips, it really means a lot to me. And I cannot paint the full picture of that mission's evolution as of writing this video. But I can assure you, as soon as I'll be able to, it will happen. It'll be a separate evolution episode. Already from what I can gather, it has quite the history. Here's a little uh, clip to give you a small taste. So yeah. It's been nearly two years since the first evolution video. Was too distracted with a bunch of other ideas. Not to mention, realizing that it'll take a lot more work to properly showcase the evolution of other stuff didn't help. In hindsight, Space Rig was the perfect start. You instantly load into the map, and then it's a matter of documenting the changes and getting the clips. Things aren't as simple for everything else. 
which is one of the reasons why it's taken me so long to finally establish this as a series. Needless to say, other large evolution episodes will take just as long. But I did have a late realization on how I can speed up production for next time. Still, some of you may be wondering, why no solo mode chapter? Why no deep dive chapter? Why no hazard level chapter? All of these are part of the mission experience after all. Well, I ask you this. Why so penis?